I am going to be talking today about um, the intersection of, of uh, two topics that I, I've worked a little bit on. I've the past few years have been looking at space-time inextendability, and I'm wondering uh, about the physical significance of this condition. And so uh, I've explored it from a bunch of different angles, but today I'm going to explore it uh, 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 in the sense that I'm going to consider its stability properties. So my thesis is that uh, it's not clear, at least not yet, that there's a physically significant sense in which space-time space inextendability is a stable property. Uh, and along the way, a number of open questions concerning uh, the modal structure of space-time will be flagged. Uh, and I need help. I, there are so many questions here. Uh, I can't possibly uh, tackle them all. There are just too many. So I, I, one of my main goals is going to be to, to describe a, uh, an area of general relativity that I think has been um, underexplored. And it has to do with the modality of uh, the, the, the modal structure of space-time, including um, some issues concerning the metaphysics uh, uh, involved there. Uh, so if you're at all uh, interested, there, I think there are, there are plenty of questions. Some are easy uh, questions, some are really hard questions, but I think there should be questions for, for everyone. Uh, so that's, that's the plan. So let's start with uh, the property of inextendability. So first let's consider a collection U of smooth, connected, Hausdorff, Lorentzian manifolds. It's too big to be a set. Uh, we'll call it a collection for today. But I want to collect up into one uh, co collection all of the space times that one usually encounters in relativity theory. Now, uh, the next thing we want to do is define an extendability, and we'll do this relative to this class U or this collection U. We'll say that a space time in U is inextendable if it can't be properly and isometrically embedded into um, a, another space time in U. So uh, take any space time you like, remove one point from the manifold, uh, the resulting structure will be a Lorentzian manifold. It'll be a space time, uh, but it will be extendable on this definition, right? Because we can take this model and we can isometrically uh, and properly embed it into the space time we started with. So the standard line, and this is what you'll find in pretty much any text uh, on general relativity, is that th there's an assumption in the background that any physically reasonable space-time uh, should be inextendable. So uh, usually there's not a, a whole lot written you know, about why this uh, should be the case. Um, usually it's just stated. If there is any kind of justification, um, it, uh, it's, it's pretty brief, and we'll get to that in, in a minute. So let's, let's ask ourselves, what, what could the justification for this uh, uh, standard line position be that all physically reasonable spacetimes must be inextendable? Well, we know it can't be based on empirical observations. It's not as if we observe the inextendability of the universe through our, our uh, measuring uh, devices. So uh, here's one, one uh, brief way to make that point. Let's say that a space-time mg is observationally indistinguishable from a space-time m prime g prime. If for every point p and m, there's a point p prime and m prime, such that the causal paths of the two points are isometric. So this is supposed to capture, you know, if, if M 
uh, G is observationally indistinguishable from M prime G prime, the idea here uh, is that um, if you're an observer in the first space time, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two based on observational uh, um, uh, measurements. So let's say that a space time has a God point. If there's a point P uh, in the space time such that the causal past of P is the whole manifold. So from, from P, you can see everything including to the future of P. Um, it's very a bizarre uh, uh, occurrence if a spacetime has a God point. If our universe does has a, have a God point, we don't know about it yet. So we might as well assume that we don't have one. And uh, so here's a proposition. Consider any spacetime you like that's inextendable that doesn't have a God point. Well, then uh, that spacetime is observationally indistinguishable from some extendable spacetime. And moreover, uh, this extendable spacetime can be chosen to be locally isometric to the one that you started with. So in other words, it's going to preserve all local properties. If you start with the vacuum solution, I can find you a vacuum solution, uh, for example. So it's, so it, it uh, preserves all local properties, and yet you can be in the model that you think is, you know, you, you might think the universe is inextendable, but uh, we have this nemesis model around, which, which is exactly like your universe in terms of what, uh, uh, what the universe looks like from making observations, um, but that is extendable. Okay, so... Uh, question again, what is the justification then if it's not empirical? Well, uh, it's pure metaphysics. So here's John Ehrman uh, uh, weighing in on this issue here. So he says, metaphysical considerations suggest that to be a serious candidate for describing actuality, a space-time should be inextendable. For example, for the creative force to actualize a proper subpart of a larger spacetime would seem to be a violation of Leibniz's principles of sufficient reason and plenitude. If one adopts the image of spacetime as being generated or built up as time passes, then the dynamical version of the principle of sufficient reason would ask, well, why would the creative force stop building if it's possible to continue? Okay, so. This is the justification that you'll see. Uh, you'll find this uh, in Penrose, in Garrosh, in Clark, in a few other places. It's a few sentences like this, and that's it. There's a gesture. Maybe Leibniz isn't named, but the, uh, the argument is Leibnizian in nature. It's saying, why in the world would a universe just stop? That's the main argument. And it, it's, not, it's no more, uh, uh, you know, worked out than that. Uh, John responds to this line of reasoning with the following. Uh, first, he says, this image does not sit well with the four-dimensional way of thinking. I mean, are we imagining that space-time is being built up in this dynamical way? Well, already we're, we're signing on to all sorts of assumptions about uh, uh, the metaphysics of space-time. But he emphasizes it runs, it runs into trouble uh, on, on its own terms in any case. Since extensions of spacetimes are generally non-unique, there may be many ways to continue building and the creative force may be stymied by a Buridan's ass choice. Some readers may be shocked by the introduction of metaphysical considerations in the hardest of the hard sciences, but in fact, leading workers in relativistic gravitation, though they don't invoke the name of Leibniz, are motivated by such principles. All right, so that seems to be uh, what folks think is uh, the justification for uh, uh, assuming this inextendability property, that it has something to do with this Leibnizian uh, 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 stance here. I'm gonna set this aside. <clears throat> we'll, <clears throat> we'll swing back in, in, in an appendix perhaps if we have time to discuss maybe some of the metaphysical issues here. For now, what I wanna do is emphasize 
that uh, the standard view faces an important conceptual difficulty. So the standard view, all physically reasonable space times must be inextendable. You can criticize that from the metaphysical angles that John uh, uh, is uh, considering here. I'm gonna move to a different uh, uh, line of uh, attack. I'm just gonna go straight to the definition and, and, and question its significance. I don't think it's significant at all as it is. And, I'll, and uh, so now I wanna say why. Inextendibility is defined relative to uh, the background possibility space U, the collection of all space times. So inextendibility is a modal property, modal in the sense that uh, we have a background possibility space that we are using to um, you know, uh, make precise what we mean when we say something like, well, Space-time ought to be as large as it can be. Well, what it can't, as large as it can be. I mean, uh, an inextendable space-time can be made larger if you allow non-Hausdorff possibilities, for example. I mean, so there's a sense in which we've fixed a, a, a very particular possibility space, and I'm going to be questioning why that one. In particular, I'm questioning why that one because we know that within the usual standard background possibility space, there lurk physically unreasonable space times of various kinds. So for example, here is a, uh, a space time where the manifold is a Mobius strip and the uh, light cones are oriented in such a way that uh, the resulting space time is, is not time orientable. Uh, and usually to get things going, uh, one finds all over the place an assumption that, that uh, you know, uh, space-time ought to be temporarily orientable and that space-times like this one ought to be classified as physically unreasonable. Throw them out, get them out of here. We don't really care about these kinds of models. They're artifacts of the uh, formalism. They're not physically reasonable possibilities. So if they're not physically reasonable possibilities, why, what are they doing in you? This space-time is in the, the collection you. Get it out of there. So uh, here's a suggestion. For a variety of physically reasonable collections P sub U, so, so any sub-collection, one could modify general relativity as follows. The new theory is to be general relativity but with the additional condition that only P space times are permitted. Uh, in this particular uh, quotation, uh, Bob is talking about the condition of whole freeness, but uh, really here, the suggestion could be uh, 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 extended to any property that could be used to kind of distinguish between unreasonable possibilities and the reasonable possibilities. So uh, you, using the suggestion, we find that under uh, each physically reasonable collection of space times P sub U, uh, you can consider this collection P a variant theory of general relativity. Now you might think that this is in some ways an uninteresting uh, variant of general relativity, but what I wanna emphasize is that it's very, very different from the standard formulation. The modal structure of space-time depends very, very crucially on which variant theory of general relativity is being considered. For example, uh, the very same space-time can be uh, both extendable according to one variant theory, but inextendable according to another. So this is a, a pretty basic idea. So just take Misner space-time, for example. You have here a cylindrical manifold and the light cone structures tipping over as you move up the manifold. Uh, now consider the bottom half as a space-time in its own right. So chop off or just delete the top half and just focus on the bottom. 
the bottom half then would be, it would be extendable according to the standard definition, because of course you can extend the bottom half into Misner itself, but it's inextendable if one were to consider the collection of all globally hyperbolic spacetimes. So if your variant theory of general relativity is the theory that uh, all physically reasonable spacetimes are globally hyperbolic and we're going to limit our collection to just globally hyperbolic uh, uh, spacetimes, well, now the bottom half of Misner counts as inextendable because any attempt to extend it ruins the global hyperbolicity. Okay, so you, and you can, you can prove that. So let's let's uh, let's get serious about this. Let's um, let's consider a general definition of inextendability that applies to all possible collections p that one might choose. So for any collection p sub u, uh, spacetime mg is going to be called a p spacetime if it's in the collection p. Pretty simple there, and. Uh, only slightly uh, uh, more complicated is this next definition, which is a P spacetime is P inextendable if it cannot be properly and isometrically embedded into another P spacetime, right? Uh, as straightforward as you can possibly uh, uh, make things. So now we have perhaps some questions that open up. So here's the first. For various physically reasonable collections P sub U, does it really matter that we work with P in extendibility rather than the standard definition of U in extendibility? Who cares? We know we can make these definitions, uh, but uh, what, are the, what are the definitions like? So here's one way of asking the same question that Bob Garrosh did back in a uh, paper on, uh, well, <laughs> here's the thing, Bob writes these papers and uh, especially around the time of like 1969, 1970, I think he had so much fucking material that he would write these papers and then they would be beautiful papers. And then at the end, he'd have these appendices and the appendices oftentimes are standalone on completely different topics that could have easily been like the paper on the subject, but they're just tucked away. So anyway, this is a paper, this 1970 paper, it's a paper on singularities, but there's an appendix on inextendability. Had he published the, in the, uh, the appendix on its own, which he could have easily done, uh, uh, I think lots of folks would be, um, I don't know, they, I, I think they, that, the, the history of global structure would, would be different because I think his, the way he sets things up is, is, is the way that I'm picking up on now, uh, many, many, many years later. But he, he started this project way back in the day. And so I'm just picking up on it. And I'm saying he outlined a number of questions in, in the appendix of this paper that I'm gonna talk about today that are still um, open. And that uh, there are other, uh, uh, nearby questions that are also interesting and open. Okay, so here's here's one question that he's posing in this in this paper. For which collections P sub U is the following true? Now here's a statement: star. Every P inextendable spacetime is U inextendable, right? So we know that the the uh, implication relation always goes the the other direction. For any P that you give me. If I if I know that it's if I know that this p space time is u inextendable, well then by definition it's got to be p inextendable. If I can't extend it at all, well then I can't extend it within p. What about the other direction? That's this question. If I take a p space time and I I can't extend it in p, does that mean that I can't extend it in u? The significance of this question is. Well, if star is true for some p, then there's no difference between the definitions. You might as well swap them, swap them out. It doesn't really matter. So it would be really, really nice if star was true for a number of collections p, because that would mean 
that uh, the work that we've done concerning the modal structure of space-time working within the standard formulation would pretty much carry over into these uh, other uh, more fine-grained uh, 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 collections uh, or the, these variant theories of general relativity, which as it stands right now, we probably ought to explore. Okay, well, so first of all, we know that star is trivially true for any subcollection of inextendable spacetime. So take any, any uh, sub, sub collection of the inextendable spacetime, such as the collection of geodesically complete spacetimes, we know that star is gonna be true. So if you can't extend a, uh, a particular spacetime uh, within the collection of geodesically complete spacetimes, well, then you can't uh, extend it at all. That's trivial. But in general, uh, star is made false for uh, all sorts of collections of physically reasonable spacetime. So that's sort of the first step uh, that I wanna uh, run, run by uh, kind of quickly here. I don't wanna um, spend too much time on this, but let's first consider some causal properties. Uh, so consider the collections of globally hyperbolic spacetimes, the distinguishing spacetimes, and the causal spacetimes. So these are just three of uh, the uh, uh, conditions on the causal hierarchy of spacetimes. We know that the uh, collection of global hyperbolic spacetimes is going to be a subset of the distinguishing spacetimes, which is a, uh, a, a subcollection of the causal spacetimes. And now you can show that uh, star is gonna be false for uh, any collection P, which is contained in the collection of distinguishing spacetimes and contains the, the globally hyperbolic spacetimes. Or P is also false if, it, if uh, P is the collection of causal spacetimes. So, this is kind of wonky and kind of weird, and I want to tell you why that is. So here's why. So uh, the first part of the result tells us this. It says, look, it's not just the case that uh, P is false if you're looking at the collection of globally hyperbolic spacetimes, or that P is false if you're looking at the distinguishing spacetimes. The claim is, is that star is going to be false for any collection that's kind of like in between those two. Right. And now the second uh, part of that proposition says, well, we know that the distinguishing spacetimes uh, make star false. And we know that the causal, the collection of causal spacetimes makes star false. So wouldn't it follow that anything in between would make star false? And I want to say, hell no, that definitely do not do that. That is not, that, that does not follow. Uh, danger. If you're thinking in those ways, you're already getting yourself turned around concerning the modal structure of spacetime because every one of the the, the fucking uh, uh, collections in between here has to be checked independently, or some additional argument has to be given here. That's what makes the modal structure these questions in, in the modal structure uh, become so crazy so fast is because um, we're talking about all possible. Um, you know, collections in between here, and and uh, there's just no um, there's there's no logical reason based on the fact that uh, p is false for dist and p is false for cause. It just doesn't mean anything about what's what's going on inside here. Okay, so I want to make that very uh, clear. It's that this point is going to come up a bit later when we talk about stability. Okay, so then I want to say. Uh, so here's the first, or one of the first open questions. Is it, is it, uh, is star false for all collections in between dist and cause? I have no idea. Uh, that, that needs to be checked. And there's all sorts of other uh, causal properties that, that could be checked as well. Now let's, let's look at the local structure of spacetime for a minute. Um, consider the collections of um, dominant energy, strong energy, weak energy, and null energy uh, condition uh, satisfying spacetimes. And uh, we have these implication relations here. 
the null, the null energy condition is the weakest. It's the biggest in terms of uh, the size of the collection. Um, uh, but you can show that um, in a similar way, star is going to be false if it's in between the null and the dominant. And what I mean by that is any collection in between there. So um, I've checked, you know, there, there, there's an argument uh, that that makes this possible. Um, and similarly for the uh, any collection between the strong energy and the null energy. So here's a challenge for you. Uh, find one, I'm talking about one, just one, I'm looking for one non-trivial collection of physically reasonable space times, which renders star true. So notice the way that we've gone through uh, the list of properties, we have the trivial ones that make star true. And then I've listed off a bunch of causal properties and a bunch of local properties, which all make star false. Is there anything that makes it true? Uh, here is an open question from Garrosh. Is true star for the collection of chronology uh, satisfying space times or the uh, vacuum space times? These are both very hard questions uh, that I and others uh, have worked on for uh, literally years. I've been trying to prove uh, uh, this true or false for, for years. I don't know uh, what, what these are. If you have chops in this area, and want to try to tackle a very beautiful question, uh, I would uh, I would look to uh, um, this this question here. Okay, so stepping back, it seems to be we ought to be uh, really careful to distinguish between the differences between the standard definition of inextendability and uh, uh, variant definition p inextendability relative to some collection p. I claim that implicitly this is being done uh, here and there uh, within uh, the community. I mean, folks know about the difference between these two definitions. It's just not always made quite as explicit as I'm making it here. But here's one good example. In formulating the, uh, his version of the cosmic censorship conjecture, Bob Wald does this when he appreciates that, of course, some maximal Cauchy developments are known to be extendable, right? So, for example, the, uh, the bottom half of a four-dimensional uh, Misner space-time counts as a, uh, uh, a maximal Cauchy development. It's a vacuum solution, uh, but it's extendable. Now, uh, the question then is, can we come up with some carefully chosen collection P such that all maximal Cauchy developments are P inextendable, even though some of them are inextendable? So um, this is all just to say that this idea of P inextendability, even though it's not put in quite the terms that I have here, it's being utilized in foundational issues in general relativity and that are connected up with the modal structure of space-time. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about inextendability. Now let's switch to stability. So in order to be a physically significant uh, property of space-time, uh, a property ought to have some form of stability. That is to say, it should be a property of nearby spacetimes. And in order to give precise meaning to nearby, uh, to the idea of nearby, one has to define a topology on the set of all spacetimes. Now, you might think that what Hawking and Ellis then do as they say this, because they, they do go on to consider uh, uh, stability, but Curiously, they don't put a topology on the, the set of all spacetimes or the collection of all spacetimes. What we here have been referring to as U. Uh, even though they say that this can be done, uh, it's to my knowledge, uh, it's been 50 years and no one has done this yet. Instead, what people do, so if you, if you know of a way, uh, uh, please let me know. I'd be so interested in this. Instead, what they do is they put various topologies on 
uh, each collection L of M, which is the collection of space times with an, the same underlying manifold M. And the most commonly used uh, topology are the CK fine topologies for K greater than or equal to zero, which is its di uh, differentiability order. And that's the one we're gonna consider here. Uh, these, this uh, topology has many names. Sometimes Hawking and Ellis, I think they refer to it as the CK open. Um, but this is the topology that stable causality is defined relative to. So uh, it's defined via the C0 fine topology. So here's the definition. Uh, you take two space times sharing the same manifold. So notice the metrics here are different, but the manifold is the same. And then uh, you consider a, a positive definite metric on M. And then at each point in M, there is a distance function uh, between the two metrics relative to uh, HAB and also relative to the, uh, the K that you pick. So, uh, it's fairly straightforward the way that you, you set this up. Once you have this distance function, you can define uh, uh, your neighborhoods. So, we'll say that a CK fine neighborhood of a space time MG is any collection N of L of M, which includes all space times MG prime such that. Uh, uh, the supremum as it ranges over M of this distance function is less than epsilon. Uh, and your J runs from zero all the way to K and H is a positive definite metric on M. E is a uh, positive number. Oh, it's very dependent on this H. So uh, here's something that pops out immediately. For, for all uh, collections Q sub P sub U, if property Q is CK stable relative, oh wait, I, I skipped stability, sorry about that. For all uh, collections Q sub P sub U, the property Q is CK stable relative to P, if for each Q space time MG, there's a CK fine neighborhood of MG such that every P space time in the neighborhood is also a Q space time. So uh, what I've done here is I am relativizing the standard definition of stability. I'm relativizing it to the background possibility space that we choose. That's the whole idea here is we're studying the modal structure of space time. We're studying variant theories of general relativity where we're choosing particular collections P, and then we're studying properties within that P. So we're looking at properties Q within our chosen collection P. And so I'm relativizing to P here. Uh, this pops out immediately. Um, if Q is CK stable relative to P, then Q is CL stable relative to, to P for all L greater than or equal to uh, K. So once you have uh, stability at, at some k, you have stability for all greater k. That pops out immediately. Um, we, we know that the coarsest of all of the CK fine topologies are still uh, quite fine. Uh, you can make that precise for this very nice argument by uh, Garash. If mg is a uh, space time and m is non compact, then if you take the space time and just multiply the metric by uh, a real number in between zero and um, infinity, and you take that whole collection, well, you'd think that this would tr this would, you know, trace out a uh, a continuous curve in your collection based on the uh, topology uh, that we've that we've chosen, but it doesn't. And uh, moreover, if you're just looking at the induced topology on the collection, that induced topology turns out to be discrete. It's almost 
as bad as things could get here. So uh, there's a sense in which the CK fine topologies are going to be too fine to adequately capture once and for all what it means to say that one space time is nearby another. I don't think it does that job at all. But, and I think the community recognizes this, but the fact that there's too many open sets in these topologies means that, that, that uh, instability results are all that more significant. It's so much harder to prove an instability result when you're working with a super fine topology. And so um, I just wanna emphasize that a stability result ought to be taken with a grain of salt using, this, using this, these topologies. But on the other hand, instability results are uh, extra significant. Okay, so uh, the first major result concerning this, uh, this framework comes from Hawking. Uh, consider the collection of uh, all space times which admit a global time function. This collection of space times admitting a global time function is CK stable relative to U for all uh, K greater than or equal to U. I, I'm sorry, uh, for, all, for all K greater than or equal to zero. So uh, if, you, if you give me a space time which is, uh, has a global time function, I can find a C0 neighborhood around that space time such that every space time in that neighborhood also has a global time function. And so it's in this sense that uh, 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 a space, uh, such a space time with a global time, time function is stably causal. It's stably causal in the sense that I can find a neighborhood around that space time which, it, which, is, which has a, a global time function. And since global time function implies that there are no closed uh, causal curves, that space time will also be causal. So it's in this sense that we have uh, um, uh, this kind of equivalence between stably causal space times on the one hand and uh, space times admitting a global time function. It's a beautiful theorem. Uh, there's no reason in in the world why this why this ought to be true, but it is, uh, and it's 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 beautiful. Uh, here's another uh, early uh, result concerning this topology: the collection of uh, globally hyperbolic space times is CK stable relative to U. Garrosh made this argument originally. There were a bunch of gaps apparently in the argument that were tied up. Uh, somewhat recently by Navarro and Minguzzi. Now, a simple but physically significant corollary to the proposition ensures that the CK stability of, of GH relative to U is going to transfer down to the CK stability of uh, the intersection between uh, uh, GH and P relative to any physically reasonable collection P. So here's the picture here. We know that uh, GH is stable relative to U. But because we know that, we know that this smaller uh, collection here, the intersection of GH with P is going to be stable relative to P. So we have this really nice transfer down theorem that, that just tells us if we prove the stability of some uh, property in U, we can, we can always just, you know, once we figure out what our P is, what our, our real possibility space is, we can, we can just transfer it down later. We don't have to prove that we can do this for all P because it just pops out, we, you know? And that's a really nice uh, uh, theorem. Here is, here, here's the general statement, just so you have an idea. For all Q sub P, and for all K, if the property Q is CK stable relative to the collection P, well then R sub P is, uh, th then for any R sub P, the property Q intersect R is going to be CK stable relative to R. This is the transfer down theorem. 
It tells us once we have stability at one level, we can transfer the stability for that property down to uh, you know, sub collections, lower levels. Okay, what other uh, collections can we explore with this, within this stability framework? Well, let GC and GI be the collections of geodesically complete and incomplete space times respectively. Here's a claim from Beam and Ehrlich from 1981. This is from their first edition of their book, Global, Global Lorency and Geometry. They state G, the collection of geodesically complete space times is CK stable relative to U for all K greater than or equal to two. So this is what they say. And now it's time uh, for some drama. If you were looking for some drama, here it is. Drama pops up all the time in global structure. Theorems become non-theorems. When people look more closely, everyone in the game has this happen to them. It doesn't matter if you're Hawking or Garrosh or whoever, uh, you are going to make claims that turn out to be false later. And this happened to Beam and Ehrlich in their first edition of this book. Here is Ehrlich, Ehrlich uh, reflecting on the matter many years later at the Beam Fest. He says, this is how matters stood between 1981 and 1985 uh, and, until a copy of P. Williams's PhD thesis, Completeness and its Stability on Manifolds with Connection was received unexpectedly in the mail. This article revealed that there was a significant gap in the previous arguments for the claim and that there, in fact, neither GDC completeness nor GDC incompleteness was CK stable. And then from a certain perspective, a good deal of research in global space-time geometry during the next decade can be viewed as trying to understand the more complicated geometry of the space of GED6 once it was realized that the claim uh, failed to be valid. So here is the claim that comes from Williams's PhD dissertation, which by the way, was never published. Uh, I don't know what happened. Uh, I can't find a, a, a record of where Williams is at these days or what he's up to but this is a beautiful dissertation. He proves that the collections of GDC com uh, complete space times and the collection of GDC incomplete space times are both unstable relative to you for any K. Let me reiterate once again, how important instability results are. Stability results like the one we saw from Hawking and Garrosh, take it with a grain of salt. Instability results, like we're seeing here from uh, Williams, very significant. By the time the second edition of their book was published, Beam and Ehrlich had worked to salvage the stability of GDC incompleteness by restricting attention to special cases. So here's a, a proposition which was, which is representative, I think, of this uh, uh, effort. So if MG is a globally hyperbolic spacetime and geodesically complete, respectively incomplete. Then there's a C1 fine neighborhood of M such that each spacetime in the neighborhood is causally geodesically complete or respectively incomplete. So take note, uh, the physical significance of this stability result, again, which we should already be taking with a grain of salt, you have to add even more grains in there because uh, uh, we're only talking about globally hyperbolic spacetimes here. So it's rather limited. And the C0 case is not, it's not considered. Are more general results available? Well, nothing so far. Even today, we don't have a good understanding of the uh, stability or instability properties of GDSIC incompleteness. Okay, so uh, we've talked about inextendability, the property, we've talked about stability as a framework for uh, uh, testing properties. Now let's do it. Let's, let's combine these into uh, a discussion of the stability of inextendability. What's known about this? Well, hardly anything. Here's the only thing I could find on the subject. 
Uh, it pops out of uh, Beam and Ehrlich's um, effort to clean things up. They prove that there's a C1 fine neighborhood of Minkowski spacetime such that any spacetime in the neighborhood is U inextendable. This is remarkable that uh, this is all we can get. That even after restricting attention to Minkowski spacetime, not just collections of globally hyperbolic spacetimes or whatever, we're restricting attention to one particular spacetime and trying to prove that that particular inextendable spacetime has its inextendability property stably. And we can't even do that in the C0 case. Are more general results available? Well, here's a conjecture. It's, uh, you know, God, if I know if this is true, but let's just, let's just consider this conjecture here for a minute. The collection of all U inextendable space times is CK stable relative to U for all K. And uh, notice that it, this is gonna be really hard to get. If this is true, we're a long way from being able to establish this. But what I, the, my main point today is that it doesn't really matter if we prove this or not. I wanna say, even if we were to prove this, it wouldn't have physical significance because there's no assurance that the stability of inextendability relative to U is going to transfer down to the P, to the stability of P inextendability uh, relative to P. So that's this point here. We have a transfer down theory for non-modal properties. If you're talking about a property like global hyperbolicity or whatever, you prove the stability of that at the level of U, you can transfer down. I'm saying if you prove the stability of U in extendability at the level of U, that means nothing once you start considering actual physically reasonable collections of space times. And in fact, here's a proposition where I, 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 I show uh, an explicit counterexample that. Um, that this transfer down uh, theorem doesn't work in general, okay? So here's, here's my proposition, and I'll talk about its significance here in a second. One can find collections P, or, uh, Q sub P contained in the collection of globally hyperbolic vacuum solutions. So all discussion of Q and P are gonna be um, these are all space times which are globally hyperbolic in vacuum. But I can choose P and Q such that P in extendability is CK stable relative to P for all K, but yet a sub collection Q of P is not uh, CK stable relative to Q for all K. So here's how I'm gonna construct uh, this, this counter example. It's very simple, but working it all out is kind of tedious. But the idea is very simple. Start with Minkowski spacetime. And in, just to make it simple, let's, let's have it be two dimensional. Roll it up along the X uh, coordinate. So the resulting spacetime is uh, globally hyperbolic and vacuum. It's automatically vacuum because it's two dimensional, but we'll, um, uh, this works in, in uh, higher dimensions as, as well. Now what I'm gonna do is once I've got MG, I'm gonna just take portions of it and consider portions of it. So for each lambda in between the closed interval between one and two, let m lambda g be the portion of mg such that uh, uh, t runs from minus lambda to lambda. And now I'm going to construct a collection q where I'm just going to take all of my m lambda g space times, so the whole collection running uh, from lambda going from 1 all the way to 2, and that's going to be q. 
that's going to be my smallest collection. And then I'm going to make Q slightly larger by throwing in MG, throwing in uh, the rolled up Minkowski space time that we started with. So then uh, hopefully it's clear that according to P, MG rolled up Minkowski is going to be P inextendable. There's no other space time in P that you can extend into. In fact, it's U, it's U inextendable. Um, and so certainly it will be P inextendable. M2, so when lambda equals two, that will be Q inextendable. You can't extend it within Q, but you can extend it within P, of course, because MG uh, is one extension. And now for all of the other M lambda space times where lambda is less than two, these are all Q extendable because M2 G uh, is one extension in Q uh, that you can go to. Okay, so we've established these facts. And uh, so here's the picture here. Q is uh, the collection of all of these um, space times that are a, a portion of MG. And this collection Q is not stable for all K. Why? Well, because you can get arbitrarily close to that space time M2 within this topology that we're considering. So, choose M2 and look for neighborhoods around it. And you'll always find, you can see I've kind of gestured, you know, you're always gonna be able to find uh, uh, some space time in Q that's, that's close enough to M2 to be in the neighborhood. On the other hand, if you, if you look around a neighborhood of MG in P, you can find a neighborhood which excludes all of the Q space times. So P in extendability is stable for all K, but Q in extendability is unstable for all K, even though Q is a subset or a subcollection of P. So that's a statement. Now, what does this mean? Uh, well, to highlight the physical significance here, let's just suppose, let's just pretend that certain results are available to us that we've wanted to get for some time now. Suppose that a version of the cosmic censorship hypothesis has been proven true and that we have a, a, a really nice clean sense in which all physically reasonable space times are globally hyperbolic. And suppose further that when we're able to show that the property of GH in, uh, in extendability is stable relative to the collection of globally hyperbolic space times. In essence, I'm saying, suppose we've identified what our collection of physically reasonable space times is, and, and moreover, let's suppose that we've proven a stability result there. That in extendability within that collection of reasonable space times uh, is, uh, is stable. Well, because there would still remain physically unreasonable space times lurking within GH, we would also want assurance that the CK stability of GH in extendability would transfer down to the CK stability of P in extendability for any collection P sub GH, right? So even if it were the case that all physically reasonable space times are globally hyperbolic, that does not mean that all globally hyperbolic space times are physically reasonable. Just because globally hyper, just because global hyperbolicity is a necessary condition for physical reasonability does not mean that it's a sufficient condition for physical reasonability. And what that means is that there's probably all sorts of uh, unex, uh, unreasonable uh, folks or uh, little guys living in GH that we don't want in there that aren't really a part of our real possibility space. And so you'd want a transfer down assurance here that whatever you're doing, at, whatever you're proving at the GH level is gonna transfer down to lower levels. And I'm saying that the proposition tells us that we, we don't have this assurance. 
And moreover, uh, the predicament persists even if we further restrict attention to space times which are uh, well behaved locally, right? So all this is happening within the context of collections which are globally hyperbolic vacuum solutions. Indeed, it's difficult to see how you might rule out as physically unreasonable a collection of globally hyperbolic vacuum solutions without invoking an inextendability property of some kind or something stronger like GDC completeness. So here's a game, rule out, my, uh, rule out this, this, these collections and you can rule them out however you want, but you're not allowed to use an extendability property to rule them out because that's, that's the very uh, thing we're exploring here. So you can't do it locally because these are vacuum solutions and it doesn't seem, seem like you're gonna be able to do it globally either. These are very well behaved in that they're globally hyperbolic. So uh, I'd be interested to hear from you later how you're gonna, how are you gonna rule these out? Whether one is justified in invoking an inextendability property of some kind is the very question under consideration. So the upshot here is that P inextendability seems to be highly sensitive to the choice of P. Even after we restrict attention to space times which are about as physically reasonable as you could possibly imagine, save their extendability properties. So it's not clear that a physically significant sense in which inextendability uh, is a stable property. Okay, so um, it's nine o'clock. Uh, I have uh, a few open questions I can go through. Uh, this will take about five minutes. Yeah, or we okay. can do that in the Q&A. No, you can go ahead. If it is for five minutes, just ask okay. your open questions. All right. So where do we go from here? Uh, of course, there's a number of questions that arise when you stick with the standard definition of inextendability. Uh, here's the conjecture again. I'd like to know the conjecture. You could start on it by uh, focusing on particular space times. Uh, here's one way to go. Just, just focus on Minkowski. Just, just focus on Minkowski and see if you can prove that Minkowski is stable with its inextended with respect to its inextendability property when you're looking at the C0 uh, topology. There's also a, a large family of questions which arise, which instead of using the standard definition, you're looking at uh, P inextendability for various physically reasonable collections, P. So uh, as we've been discussing, is the collection of all uh, GH inextendable space time, CK relative to, uh, or uh, CK stable relative to GH. And you could get started on that by focusing on, uh, for example, Minkowski space time again. So here's, an, here's possibly the easiest open question res with respect to all of the stuff that I've been talking about. Consider Minkowski space time and leave the standard definition behind, try to show that there's a C0 fine neighborhood of Minkowski spacetime, which is um, stable relative to uh, GH in extendability. Okay, so, and now all that's left is my metaphysical appendix. And so I think of, uh, this we can maybe uh, run through in the Q&A if people are interested in the metaphysics. Uh, first in line, we have uh, Joanna Lutz. So please, Joanna, go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, I would like uh, to ask you about uh, the uniqueness issue. So in this quote by Erman at the beginning, um, uh, he was uh, um, he was criticizing <clears throat> this argument for in this metaphysical argument for inextendability uh, by referring to the fact that um, extensions might not be unique. And uh, my question is, um, uh, could we find um, such conditions um, 
defining a class of space times p as such that um, even though um, elements of this class uh, at least some elements are extendable uh, the maximal extension is unique or what would be the most general conditions defining such class if Mm -hmm. or the most general known conditions yeah i think uh um non-uniqueness is going to be uh pretty much everywhere here's one case in which i can um uh define such a p as you are as you are considering so um consider a collection P, which is all of the inextendable space times, plus throw in all of the inextendable space times where you've removed one point from the manifold. If you remove one point from a manifold, so go back to uh, this space time here. If you start with an inextendable space time and you remove one point, it turns out, and this is highly non-trivial, and this is found in, in no textbook uh, uh, that I've been able to uh, find. I've uh, emailed so many people about this question, Bob Garrosh, one of them, but all of, the, all of the major players in general relativity in 2020, I've emailed them about this question, whether or not you can prove that once you have an inextendable space-time, remove a point, is the extension are, are all possible extensions of this space time just going to give you back what the one that you started with in other words is the extension unique up to isometry and uh, after asking a bunch of people i finally uh uh received a proof uh uh in in, in my email from sergey krasnikov so it's true. And so if you had a collection like that, you, you would get uniqueness. But uh, in general, unless you're dealing with very strange space times like that, uh, you're not going to find uniqueness. So even if you had two, two points removed, well, now you've got a situation in which you can put, a, you can put back one of the points or the other. So all, already you have, uh, you, you have non-uniqueness. Okay, but uh, perhaps what I was asking, um, my question was a little bit different. Uh, okay. It was about uh, unique maximal extension. So, okay, if I remove two points, I have um, more than one uh, possible extension, <clears throat> but uh, I, I guess I still have um, the unique maximal extension, right? So, um, so my question was, uh, what are uh, if there are known uh, some conditions under which the maximal extension would be unique? Uh, yeah, the only one that I know about is this one. So the maximal extension, uh, are, are, do you mean maximal extension relative to you, maximal extension relative to some P? Um, uh, okay, I guess I'm, hmm. I guess I primarily meant, uh, maximal extension relative to this p but in general perhaps both you and this p we are considering yeah my guess is well within you uh the only uh unique maximal extension is going to be the situation which i described where you remove one point that it only has that's the only 
type of spacetime that's going to have a unique maximal extension. Within P, uh, I would have to think about whether this theorem transfers down to uh, a, any collection P. My guess is that it would, but uh, I'm not sure. But so the idea there would be to take any maximal P spacetime, remove a point. Is there a unique maximal P extension? My guess is yes. The tools would, that would be used to prove that would be the same tools uh, used to prove it at the level of U. But I would need to think. That's a good question. OK, thank you. Thank you. Next in line, we have uh, Vincenzo Fano. Enzo, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Antonio. Thank you very much uh, for uh, your very beautiful uh, presentation, uh, very clear. In the, in the last part, I was a bit lost. <laughs> Uh, I have to think about, and uh, I have two general questions. The first one is about uh, inextendibility. Uh, correctly, you say that uh, this metaphysical kind of argument uh, favoring uh, inextendibility of uh, space time are a bit uh, extra physical in the sense that they, they are they are not something completely convincing but uh, uh, perhaps it is possible to coach these kind of arguments in a physical uh, sense in, in the sense that uh, you define a space time you have to find some uh, physical reason to limit the to bond this space time sort of uh, contemporary represent Reproposition re of Arkita paradox in the sense that uh, to find a limit you have to, to find some physical reason. In this sense, uh, this, this argument becomes something more physical and perhaps uh, something more palatable. I don't know what you think about. Second question about uh, uh, proof, uh, general proof uh, on these very important uh, topics uh, like. Uh, stability uh, and other uh, problems of uh, general kinds of space-time. Uh, yes, I, uh, we know that uh, Gero uh, proposed importance in the 70s, the importance of this kind of uh, general reflection about uh, a classification of space-time, even if uh, uh, this kind of space time are not directly physically reasonable because he said that uh, this kind of uh, space time could become something physically reasonable. So, to, to reason about, uh, to nage, and to say something and to find theorem about these uh, different classes of space time is uh, something relevant from a physical point of view. Uh, but I have some I have some problem with uh, uh, proof uh, about, for instance, take the, the concept of stability. Why is it so important uh, in, in theoretical physics uh, stability? Because uh, we know that all our observations are approximate. So if uh, we introduce in our analysis of space-time uh, uh, not uh, sufficiently stable notion. Uh, it is possible that uh, a small mistake, a small error in the measurement of, of certain observable can, can, can make a big difference, okay? Mm -hmm. And so stability is important from uh, a physical point of view in the, in, in the problem of the nexus between uh, experimental data on one side and the theoretical consequence of this experimental data on the other side. Uh, but to find that uh, uh, a certain class of space-time or, or a certain kind of property is not st stable, to be to be this uh, uh, proof uh, physically reasonable, I think that uh, the counterexample must be, in a certain sense, physically reasonable. In the sense that if I, I can find a mathematical counterexample that is uh, 
completely devoid or at least uh, strongly devoid of physical meaning, I have I, I found a theorem, a very interesting theorem from a mathematical point of view. It is very beautiful, very very fine, but uh, for instance, in relation to the concept of stability, could be not completely rele relevant in the sense that uh, if a certain property is unstable with respect to counterexamples that are not physically relevant, perhaps this proof is not so important from an epistemological point of view. I don't know if what you think about the second point. Thank you very much. Anyway. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let me start with the second one, just because it's fresh in my mind here. Um, I, I, I think you are touching on a, uh, a point that uh, I do hear from time to time and that I leave myself open because, uh, you know, uh, of the way that um, work in global structure generally um, proceeds in the way that I do my, my own work here. Uh, we know that within global structure, it's a very unusual mathematical framework. And what I mean by that is this. Um, Gerush and Horowitz back in 1979 uh, spent some time in a survey article describing what it's like, what, what this mathematical field is like. And they made, um, uh, I, I, I think, th three points. So the first one was a comment on uh, definitions. They said that un unlike other mathematical fields, the definitions within global structure are very few. There's only a handful, really. There's, it's, not, it's not a complicated uh, uh, field in, in that sense. And the definitions are fairly straightforward. That's number one. Number two is that the uh, theorems are scattered. There's no central theorems. Instead, you get a hodgepodge of this little result over here, this little result over here, this little result over here. And that they connect up together in this very strange way, but it's hard to see what really is going on because there are no central theorems. There's no fundamental theorem of global structure. The third thing is the most important one. And it's, it's the one where he talks about uh, examples. Examples within global structure are central. Why? Because of the scattered nature of the way that the propositions are, are structured throughout the theory. Essentially, and he says this, if you're confronted with a problem, the first thing to do is not to try to prove it. If you, if you have some proposition, you don't know, uh, you know the status of it, the, your first instinct should be to try to find a counterexample because that is usually the way forward. There's almost always a counterexample to any plausible statement that you might want to make. So that's just describing a weird world. It's the weird world of uh, global structure within general relativity. And within this weird world, it's, it's unlike other uh, areas of mathematics and other areas of physics. And within this world, then, counterexamples become very important. Uh, and that's why you have the early, in the early days of global structure, all of this, you know, Penrose cutting and pasting and Gera, you know, all of that stuff is them taking, you know, trying to, you know, what, what do you want to do when you want to prove that the uh, causal past of a point uh, isn't necessarily closed? Well, you start removing points, you start pasting together things, you know, you construct counterexamples. And here's the point, though, these counterexamples are not physically reasonable. These counterexamples that are constructed have no physical significance at all, but that does not matter in the least. The whole point is to find an example of any kind to block some kind of proposition that you might have thought was true. And so uh, the physical significance tends to not be uh, central within this field. Why? Because the, the claim is not that I found a counterexample that is physically reasonable. What I'm rather what I'm claiming 
when, when I'm doing my work or when, uh, you know, Garrosh or Penrose or whoever is doing their work, they're claiming that um, this counterexample uh, shows that a certain assertion is not going to go through um, that one might have wanted to have. And so in, in, in this particular case today, the assertion is just, hey, we know that, there, that the differences between uh, the standard definition of inextendability and the way that it gets fractured into a, into a thousand different P inextendability definitions, we know that there, that there are differences there. We know that within non-modal properties, we have a really nice transfer down theorem that says, hey, if you prove something relative to you, it's going to transfer down to P. And all I'm saying is I have a counterexample, and I've tried to make it as physically reasonable as possible by showing that it satisfies a lot of conditions that are usually uh, necessary or considered necessary for physical reasonableness. But it's not as if I think that uh, a truncated Minkowski spacetime is a physically reasonable spacetime. No, instead what I'm doing is I'm just saying, look, now the burden is on you if you want to say something about the stability of, of uh, uh, in extendability, the burden is on you to show that um, proving stuff at this high, high level, like uh, folks tend to try to do, is going to transfer down to P. And I'm saying you, you can't do it. And moreover, uh, usually when folks are looking at these counterexamples, the first move is to say, okay, is there some way we can rule it out? Is there some way we can rule out Garrosh's, you know, counterexample of, you know, where he's doing this cut and paste routine. And usually you can come up with a, uh, a, a condition pretty easily to do that. So you might say, well, but that, that one, you know, it's, um, it has a hole in it. Or that one, um, you know, uh, oftentimes actually, uh, you, you might wanna say, oh, that, that one's extendable. <laughs> it's, it's not inextendable. So you might point to certain space-time properties and say, well, I like the counterexample, but now um, let's, now we have to look at, at uh, more of the physical significance here. We're gonna have to get into the weeds of it. And uh, oftentimes it's not possible to hold on to your counterexample when you're being required to satisfy certain constraints. I am saying here, I've already done pretty much everything I possibly could do, right? I mean, we're talking about vacuum solutions here. We're talking about globally hyperbolic space times here. What more could you want other than an extendability, a, a, an, an inextendability property? If you want to talk about, well, maybe it doesn't, it's not generic, it has too many symmetries. Fine, I can wiggle it around in the middle and produce those asymmetries and I'll still ma make it work. So I, I really am asking you, not, not you personally, but, but the group here to come up with a condition to rule out um, my space times uh, that, that doesn't make reference to an extendability property. And I, I think, I, 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 I think uh, that's gonna be a very hard thing to do. And so this is all just to say that, I think your point is a very good one in that uh, we ought to be careful about the significance of propositions, especially when we're, uh, you know, presenting these things that look awfully unphysical. But that, in a way, is precisely my point. I'm saying, um, yeah, they may seem, you know, you might have a gut reaction that these are unphysical or that my proposition is unphysical because I'm using these space times to prove it. But I'm saying, uh, yeah, I have the same gut, in, gut um, intuition here in that, something about extendable space times kind of rubs, rubs me the wrong way. But I'm trying to explore that. I'm trying to figure out what, is it, what exactly is going on and it's not yet clear to me. And so that's my point is that it's not yet clear. Remember my thesis. My thesis is not that um, uh, inextendable, uh, the property of inextendability is uh, not stable in some physically significant sense. No, my thesis is just, we don't know. And uh, so if we're going to try to figure out the stability properties of inextendability, we're gonna to have to do an awful lot more exploring. 
And that's, uh, that's my point. But, but notice that that point, it, it seems very, you know, like, oh, well, that's weak sauce then. That's not even really a point. Well, it really is a point because everyone in the world says it's taking the standard line and telling us that every physically reasonable space time must be inextendable, not just inextendable relative to some physically reasonable property P, but inextendable relative to this physically unreasonable property U, uh, uh, collection U. So anyway, it's just to say that uh, this, 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 this claim seems modest or seems weak, but it actually is, it, go, it cuts against almost everything written about this uh, property in the literature. I, anyway, I, I, I hope that kind of touched on your second question. Um, what about your, can you repeat your first question again? Yes, yes, my first uh, question was about, about extendibility. And there are, in, in the literature, there are uh, metaphysical and mathematical arguments favoring uh, extendibility and both uh, are not very convincing. But perhaps there is a, a more modest physical argument in the sense that uh, space-time uh, to be bonded must be bonded by something, for instance, a Big Bang or a black hole or some, some other physical singularity, and not by, by uh, something that is on the basis of our uh, contemporary physics not completely uh, not uh, not reasonable. So so there is a sort of uh, a physical reason to think that, uh, and, and many theoretical physicists uh, indeed they think that uh, space time must be extended as much as it is possible. It's not a metaphysical or mathematical question uh, like Herman and Gerhoff told in the past. Perhaps this is a good argument. I, I would like to know your opinion on this. Yeah, I think it's going to depend on uh, on the details there. So take the idea of a singularity um, um, uh, uh, creating, you know, um, a you know. Um, well, I, I think the first thing to say is that the definite the very definition of a singularity presupposes that we've got uh, the extendability stuff figured out. So the way uh, Garrosh does it is to um, first define what a singularity is relative to an inextendable spacetime, because we know that um, any extendable spacetime is going to be geodesically complete, or I'm sorry, geodesically incomplete. And so if you're taking as your definition of a singularity, geodesic incompleteness, well then that would mean that uh, any uh, extendable spacetime is going to have a singularity. So there's a sense in which considering extendable spacetimes is considering spacetimes with singularities. Now you may think, well, but uh, Minkowski spacetime just stopping, that's not a real singularity because, uh, you know, there's nothing there that should be stopping it. And to that, I would like to say that what makes us so sure that, for example, as mother nature is building spacetime, that there even exists an inextendable space-time that can be extended into. So this goes into my uh, appendix, since now we are talking about this, metaphys this metaphysical issue and it's, it's coming up, I want to state uh, this very clearly because I think it, it's, it's relevant to, to uh, what you're asking here. The metaphysical justification for the standard line rests upon this, this fact that Garrosh proved back in the 70s in this, in this paper. Every U extendable spacetime has a, a U inextendable extension. You can't hold the standard line unless you've got inextendable spacetimes around that you can extend into in all cases. Otherwise, you might get yourself tied up in a situation where you're your, your space-time is extendable, and so you extend it a little bit, and then that space-time is extendable, you extend it a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more, and you say, well, we'll just, just go till you can't extend anymore. And, and what I am claiming is that within 
the context of you, we know the answer is you can always just make it maximal by this theorem. It's a really beautiful, nice theorem. But what I wanna say is, once again, the significance is not clear to me now because he's proving it on the level of you. And so we don't have a transfer down uh, uh, notion here. And so one could explore, well, for, first of all, all known proofs of uh, this rely on Zorn's lemma. So we've de-Zornified a bunch of results within uh, general relativity, including um, the proof that there exists a maximal Cauchy development. This has not been de-Zornified. So there's that question and how that all fits in with all this stuff, because it seems like if we're relying on metaphysics to do the work of saying that all physically reasonable space times ought to be inextendable. And the metaphysical stuff relies on the Garrosh proposition that this uh, going to an inextendable space time is always possible. And that relies on Zorn. What's going on? There's also related questions now where consider double star, where we've relativized the Garrosh theorem relative to a choice of P. Is it the case that every P extendable spacetime has a P inextendable extension? Well, for all local properties, yeah, it's true. I do invoke Zorn. Uh, chronology, true. I also have to invoke Zorn there too. What's the situation with the global time function? God, God if I know. And moreover, uh, uh, Lowe has shown that Zorn seems to be useless in this case. So you can try to use Zorn to prove it and it doesn't seem to help. So this is a really good test case. If you're looking for a nice open question, you might wanna tackle this one. If you have a global time, a, a, a space time which satisfies, which has a global time function and you can extend it into another space time with the global time function, can you extend it into a maximal global uh, space time with, the, with, with respect to uh, being or having a global time function? I have no idea. But now we're getting into some interesting questions that relate to your uh, question, um, Vincenzo. So we know that double star is false for the collection of all uh, big bang space times. And what I mean by big bang space times is uh, these are space times where the uh, maximal ca causal geodesics are, are all past incomplete. So if you take all the geodesics and you go backwards in time, they come to a singularity. Take the collection of those big bang models. Well, let's say that you have a big bang model and it can be extended into a bigger big, ba big bang model. And that can be extended into a bigger big bang model and so on and so on. Is there a biggest big bang model that you can extend into? Well, no, actually, no. And so this raises the question. This I think is the most important question up here. Take any singularity theorem you like and look at the assumptions of the theorem. The, all the assumptions that get, that get it to go Take those assumptions, use those assumptions to, to define a class S or a collection S of spacetimes. We know this is going to be a subcollection of the geodesically incomplete spacetimes since it's a singularity theorem, right? All of the spacetimes which satisfy S are geodesically incomplete. They have a singularity. Fine, great. Well, take that S, that collection S, and now ask. If you have a collection of spacetimes which are in S that have a singularity and that are physically reasonable, and you can extend into a bigger model with the singularity that's physically reasonable, and you can extend that into a bigger model which is uh, uh, physically reasonable with the singularity, is there a biggest one with a singularity that's physically reasonable. And I have no fucking idea whether that's true or not. And moreover, I don't know if it's true uh, if uh, you, you're not allowed to use Zorn. 
So there's all sorts of questions here which touch on, well, you know, we don't really understand singularities all that well, as it turns out. I mean, we do in, in, in some sense, but we have, I, I claim that uh, if anyone thinks that they know the answer to this question, um, I, I'd, I'd love to see the proof. I have no idea. And so uh, I, I don't think bringing in physical things like singularities will show us that you know, here's the end of, of space time. And if it's not a singularity, it won't, because I don't think we have the resources here to, 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 to know that there's always going to be uh, a maximal guy around that you can extend into. I don't know. That's my long-winded attempt at this at this uh, answer. Um, but maybe I've missed something. Maybe maybe you have other things to say now. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your very long very long answer. Um, I attempted to uh, resume what you you told uh, to see if I understood. This is important uh, for my research. The, the, the answer to my second question is essentially that uh, in a certain sense, even if the counter example are unphysical, in a certain sense, if, if we find a counter example, we are pushed again in a situation of ignorance with respect to a certain question. And so even if uh, this does not show the, in a definitive way that uh, uh, this notion is useless. It shows that we are not sure that it is useful. Okay, this is the, the first point. The second point. The first one is that uh, you say, yes, uh, even if uh, we attempt to coach uh, the our argument in, in uh, favoring uh, uh, inextendibility, not in mathematical or metaphysical way, as Gerhoff and Erma in the past uh, made, but we attempt to, to, to formulate this argument in a physical uh, way, basing on the notion of singularity, we uh, meet a lot of problems. Uh, first, 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 first one, because we need a certain lemma that is controversial. And second one, uh, because uh, this attempt to, to um, uh, because uh, in, in, in this context, uh, uh, theorem like uh, the one of Geros, Geros is not valid. And so, yeah, we we are in, sorry? It's back to this idea that we don't know. So we're pushed to yes, ignorance. Yes, yes. We don't know. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. Fine. JB, is there anything that you want to add regarding uh, your metaphysical appendix? No, that's 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 my that's it. Okay, okay, thank you for that. So, uh, Eric, you want to ask a question? Yeah, thank you. So, um, I actually have a proposal or a mark, and I want to push JB on a claim he made. Okay. So, um, the proposal is for. Globally hyperbolic vacuum ruling some out without using um, extendability. Okay. So how about using something uh, using some weird topological property like um, not quasi not quasi locally simply connected? Those are pretty weird manifolds. Or else um, another one might be. Th this is actually something I don't know. You know this. Um, it, if a manifold is not parallelizable, if it doesn't have a spinner structure, can it can it be vacuum? Because I know it can't have a flat metric. So if so that 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 would, that would be an example. If it could have if it, if it could have a vacuum metric, then I think not having a spinner structure would be unphysical. So uh, those okay. are just, I will I will need to think about that. Um, but backing but step stepping back, uh, would you be willing to be on the record as saying that those properties uh, are uh, necessary for physical reasonableness? No, no, I wouldn't personally because I think physical reasonability is always, is, is very context is very context sensitive. I think it depends on like what kind of what other kinds of questions you're asking. I don't think I don't think there is such a thing as you know the the definition of physical reasonability. You know, cap, capital P, capital R, capital T with for the. Uh, I see. I, I'm, it, I'm, very, I'm, very, I'm very pragmatic about that. Is your pragmatics in this context here? Is are you just trying to come up with something that'll shoot it down, or why those? What, what, what's um, the... um, well, because if you don't have a spinner structure, you, can't, um, you, you don't have quantum fields. 
So you, you can't you can't do you, you can't do physics as we know it and love it. So that that seems to be a problem. Um, the quasi locally simply connected it's just it's just going to be a really weird manifold. Um, you are going to have these holes every these sort sort of holes everywhere that aren't really holes. It, it's just going to be a really weird manifold. But yeah, well, I, uh, without knowing much more about it, I, I would say that if it's a really weird manifold, I'm probably not going to be able to make this go through. The only reason I could make this go through was I was able to compactify my spatial direction so mm -hmm. that um, uh, I'm doing all of my stretching of manifolds within a compact region. Yeah, you're not going to be, yeah, the, the examples I'm thinking of, you're not going to be able to do that. Yeah. But, and we okay. talk about that later. So, the, what's, um, what's the next one? So, the remark I have is um, about um, uh, about the idea that, and I, I know this is this is not something you endorsed in the, in the talk, but it's something that 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 kind of came up, and that comes up a lot in in, the, in these kinds of issues, in these kinds of discussions. The idea that um, there's something artificial or unnatural or cheating about removing point clumps from a manifold, mm -hmm. and I just think that's I, I I've never understood that. That to, to me, um, I have no given how incredibly you know wild and woolly relative to the space science can get without removing a point, why should removing a point be so terrible? <laughs> and anyway, the fact, the, fact, the fact that we think that in some, that in some way R4 is like, is like more, is more natural than R4 with the point, with the point removed, that just has to do with our prejudices about how we do math. Because you can do, you, you can do all differential geometry instead of using R4 as your base space, using R4 as the point removed as your, as, as your, you know, as, as your base target space. So it just that, that I have no I have no idea why the world would respect our our our, our preferred ways of doing math. Yeah. Uh, bless your bless your heart, Eric. I mean this your this is, I mean you're saying things that I'm afraid to say out loud. Uh, <laughs> in certain companies. I don't, I don't know, JB. You you you're pretty creative when it comes to, to saying things out loud. You said some crazy stuff. I'm I'm pretty radical in my um, to put it in Vincenzo's words. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I'm pretty radical in my stance on our state of ignorance, and so that applies here in the sense that I don't want to come out and say that space times with a point removed are somehow okay or physically reasonable in some sense, but I'm. I'm just as uncomfortable saying that they are not physically reasonable. Um, yeah, but I, I, so I, th I think you and I are, are are in agreement are are in agreement about that. Yeah, I I, I just so, think there's too much at issue here to think that you. I mean, there's just too much unknowns to to think that you have a good handle on what is a physically reasonable space time. I don't think we know that. Yeah, I, I don't either. I don't even. Well, I as, as I said before. Yeah. I, I, I very I very strongly doubt there even is such a thing as D definition, but I, I, I want to push you on the claim you made about the fact that it's it, that um, instability claims when you have superfine topologies are um, are important because to, um, to my mind so it, it is true that if you can prove instability with super I mean it's much harder to prove instability with a finer topology than a coarser topology that's just that follows the definition of stability, but the, still proving instability with with with, um, with regard to a, a very fine top very fine in some sense a very fine topology doesn't yet tell you any doesn't yet by itself tell you anything of physical significance unless you know that there's a coarser a strictly coarser topology that's physically significant right right and we and we and we don't know that in this case right yeah yeah so. so that that is exactly the sense in which I was saying so you you articulated it beautifully. Um, if we found the right topology uh, and we knew that somehow it was strictly coarser than the CK fine topology I'm talking about in here in this uh, 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 presentation, then you would know that any instability result that you prove here is going to transfer over to uh, your coarser topology. But what you're saying is, well, but why in the world would the right topology be necessarily strictly coarser than this really fine one? Well, point taken. Um, 
but uh, I only have what I have to work with. I only really have this topology. I mean, there are really only two topologies on the table. Uh, the one that I'm considering here and the one where instead of looking at your supremum ranging over the whole manifold, you're just looking uh, uh, for it ranging over compact sets. The one seems to be too fine. The other one seems to be too coarse. There's not much in the middle there, although I hear that maybe Sam Fletcher has something uh, in there that he, he wants to say is somehow in the middle. Um, but really, yeah, we, we don't have a good sense of the options. And all I'm saying is, I'm trying to do the best with the cards that I have in my hand. And so I'm gonna play this super, super fine card. And then I'm gonna say, uh, I'm gonna prove an instability result with respect to this one. There's no better play than that. I couldn't, I mean, doing stuff with the course topology is stupid. Um, and uh, so this is the, yeah, like I said, it's the only play I, that, that I really have at the moment. It, okay. it, may, it may be that uh, that this play uh, at the end of the day isn't physically significant because of the choice of topology um, to which I will want to just then th th then I think I'm just puzzled because then I don't understand what's going on with all this work concerning stability of various properties like you know the stuff that Hawking and Garrosh and you know, a lot of other folks are doing now, not with respect to stability with uh, on four manifolds, but stability of, you know, the Cauchy development, that kind of stuff. Really, I, I just, uh, a lot of that stuff, I, I have, it doesn't seem as though there's uh, a strong connection between the physical significance of what they're doing and the mathematical stuff that they're up to. And that could right. be my uh, situation eventually too. But I guess I just want to say, given how important stability has been in the study of global structure, and in particular, how important this particular topology has been for that study, this is my play. So, I agree. That makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Good questions.